You are listening to a Practical Poetry Podcast with Dale Byron. That's me. Nothing rarefied or pretentious here. No hothouse poems. Rather, here you will find hard-working poetry. Poems as tools for living more full and satisfying lives. Here you'll find commentary, poems, and the occasional song to help us remember what's most important in our lives, to help us understand what's happening, to grow and rebalance ourselves when needed, and of course, poems to inspire us and to help us experience more gratitude. And finally, and finally, poems to help us with loss, grief, and healing. In this particular episode featuring the amazing poetry uh, and work of poet Wendell Berry, we will tease up on a huge mind-boggling question. That question being, what role, and hint, there's a big one, what role can poetry play in helping us close our current wisdom gap? When it comes specifically to our massive ecological challenges and predicaments. Well, let's start with a little introduction and context. I've entitled um, this particular episode, The Role of Poetry in Closing the Wisdom Gap, featuring, as I've already said, the extraordinary poetry of Wendell Berry. Here, let me include a shout-out to Tristan Harris and Nate Hagens, who had a most interesting and insightful conversation that I listened to recently on the podcast, Nate's podcast, The Great Simplification, which is a wonderful resource, by the way. Uh, This is where I heard the term, the wisdom gap. And when it comes, or and when it comes to our current ecological crisis and predicament, you could apply this term in many ways. I'll just say the wisdom gap for me is proven by the results that we're seeing, that we're getting with climate disruption, with ocean acidification, with plastic pollution in every corner of the globe, with habitat destruction, extinctions, soil erosion, forest destruction, and we could keep on going, but you get the idea. These are all problems of massive overshoot in our uh, world, on our planet. Let's just say this, if our current level of wisdom has led us into all these conditions, really predicaments, and in some cases, catastrophes, And it has. This wisdom that we are currently following has led us here. Well, then we simply need to upgrade that wisdom, our wisdom. And another way we could say it then would be to reduce the wisdom gap. Well, Yes, of course. I'll, let me just say and hasten to add that poetry is going to play a central role in this as we dig into our subject. That's the whole purpose of this podcast. But let's start with a wonderful quote first by E.O. Wilson, the American biologist, naturalist, and writer who was such an amazing uh, human being and who we just lost in the last year or so. Uh, on this plane, anyway, and um, I was uh, I was also I was reminded of this quote during the conversation that I referenced above uh, in that podcast with Nate and Tristan. Uh, the quote is this by E. O. Wilson: "The problem of humanity, the problem of humanity, is the following: We have Paleolithic emotions. We have Paleolithic." emotions, medieval institutions, and God-like technology. Let's let that sink in for a minute. The problem, the challenge with we human beings is we have Paleolithic 
emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Now, what could possibly go wrong? Now, of course, there are many ways to approach this subject, but it seems to me that wisdom, wisdom requires three things, and we're going to focus on those three things, and we're going to focus on the poetry that helps us work on these three things and experience these three things with the idea that that gets us at least a little closer, a little closer to upgrading our and growing our wisdom. So those three things for me, or essentially wisdom requires, number one, the ability to see context, to see context, which, if you think about it, is really the ability to see whole systems or the ability, we could say, to do systems thinking, which is how it's put often. And in our current culture and economic system, we not only do not see context or systems, uh, we purposely push them aside. Have you noticed? This is why the air, the sea, the forest are all considered in our economic system currently to be externalities, which means we do not have to consider or even account for them. Now, that is changing. That is changing because people are seeing the absolute, complete insanity of that position. But that's one uh, wisdom that we are going, or one component of wisdom is the ability to see and appreciate and experience broader context or systems, we could say. Number two of three things is the ability to practice humility. Wow, this is huge. The ability to practice humility is really our ability to admit our own human frailties and considerable, have you noticed, vulnerabilities. So that's number two. That's the second thing, requirement in my mind for wisdom. And the third one is the ability to embrace paradoxical thinking, which means, which means we can work with and embrace the deeper complexities in this world. Now, one of my mentors, Brother David Stendelrass, used to say, not every great, or I'm sorry, not every paradox is a great truth. Not every paradox is a great truth, but in order to be a great truth, it must, it must be a paradox. So the third and final of the three uh, conditions for upgrading our wisdom, for closing the wisdom gap, is the ability to embrace paradoxical thinking Again, which means we can work with and embrace the deeper complexities in this world. Now, um, but what about my claim that certain kinds of poetry can help us embrace these three things to uh, help us with these three, these three things and therefore to embrace new levels of wisdom? Well, let's try out a poem by our featured poet, Wendell Berry, called How to Be a Poet. Okay, How to Be a Poet by Wendell Berry. It goes like this. He has a little quote in parens right under the title of the poem, and it says, to remind myself, to remind myself. Poem goes like this. Make a place to sit down. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must... Depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience. For patience joins time to eternity. 
any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. That's the first of three stanzas in this short poem. Let's read it again. Make a place to sit down. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have, inspiration, work, growing older, patience, for patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. Well, let's pause here for a quick second and talk about the very first few lines. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. To me, he is immediately talking about the context within which he is asking us to embrace the poem in this case, the story that he is telling in the poem. And by the way, as you listen, you know, you could say how to be a poet. Now, if that sounds esoteric to you, just replace it with with how to be a good friend or how to be a courageous ecological activist or how to be um, a good and steady uh, mate in a relationship. You could name it all those things, and I think we would not be far off. So he begins to set the context, and by his setting the context, make a place to sit down, sit down, be quiet. By doing so, he is saying context is important. Context is important. He says, um, you must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience, for patience joins time to eternity. Any readers, any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. Oh, well, I think it's so juicy because obviously he is talking about a kind of humble stance, a humility. Um, When he says in this first stanza, these first few uh, lines, when he says that you uh, will need inspiration and uh, you will need all these things, affection, reading, knowledge, and all these things, skill, and he's saying you'll need more of each than you have humility, humility in this story that he's telling us. Okay, let's move to the second of three stanzas. He says, breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensional life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. What's wonderful there is he is talking about uh some suggestions and you know one of it could be that perhaps we're spending too much time on social media so we might take his uh, advice and stay away from that we might talk about living a three-dimensional life which is out in the world which is a real human life and he says stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in oh wonderful conversation, wonderful line about how important context is. How if we forget context, as we are encouraged so often to do in our culture, how else would we be able to rationalize not counting the pollution 
the externality of air pollution, the externality of microbead plastic in every, virtually every living thing on this planet? How could we uh, uh, not count the externality of um, uh, forest dying, of soil eroding? How could we do that? The only way we could do that is to ignore context, to ignore the system, to ignore and to create boundaries which are so small and so artificially drawn that we exclude most of the world, the parts that we don't count. So stay away, the voice in the poem says. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. Oh, what wisdom. And finally, the paradox in this second paragraph, second stanza, excuse me. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places places. Nothing is unsacred. Look down. You are already standing, as the saying goes, on a sacred ground. Last and final stanza. Except what comes from silence, except what comes from silence, make the best you can of it of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers, prayed back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. The final lines of the poem. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it, of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers prayed back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. How this teaches us these few lines, these few words, how they teach us about paradox. How can we make a poem that does not disturb the silence for, from which it came? What does that mean? Well, we know there's a paradox in the sound of the word and the silence that it comes from, and we can begin to tease up and understand that. But in its essence, it is a paradox. How can, um, how can we make the best of? How can we speak? How can we speak and have that speaking come from silence? And how can we have those words be infused with silence? I don't know. It's paradoxical. But on another level, we do know. We do know what that means. All these lessons about context or systems and humility and paradox in this short poem. Okay, now, before we move to another poem by our featured poet, Wendell Berry, as we continue to test the thesis of today's podcast, which is that poetry has a special ability to help us uh, increase, even in small ways, our wisdom or help us upgrade our wisdom, help us close the wisdom gap, as we are saying, um, and help us in these three ways that we're talking about, which is the ability to see context more clearly and more fully, which is another way of saying to see systems and to be less blind to the all the parts of 
these systems that are so important these days. Uh, two, the ability to practice humility. Oh, how important that is, uh, you know, to admit our human frailties and actually to create systems that um, help us address our vulnerabilities as opposed to helping us uh, become even more vulnerable, which is what happens in our modern world so often with um, social media. And then finally, the ability to embrace paradoxical thinking, which means, in one thing it means is being able to embrace the deeper complexities in the world. I also, uh, as we switch gears here, I wanted to bring another uh, E.O. Wilson quote, which I, for obvious reasons, find really interesting. Um, and I hope you'll find it interesting as well. He said, E.O. Wilson said, the most successful scientist, the most successful scientist thinks like a poet. Well, I love that. The most successful scientist thinks like a poet, wide-ranging, sometimes fantastical, and works like a bookkeeper. It is the latter role that the world sees. <laughs> oh, I think that's just wonderful. You know, uh, the great um, scientist of our interior, Sigmund Freud, once said, every, every place I go, every place I go as a scientist, I find, I find that a poet has beat me there. Sigmund Freud, every place I go as a scientist, I find that a poet has beat me there. Okay, let's get back to our featured poet. And I want to give a quote by um, Wintleberry. He said, Nobody can discover the world for somebody else. Only when we discover it for ourselves does it become common ground and a common bond, and we cease to be alone. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, um, maybe I should mention, I actually don't have it in my notes right in front of me, but I have loved Wendell Berry's poetry for so long that I know a little bit about him. Um, he is a farmer, an active farmer. He also, of course, is a poet. He's a writer and has written novels. And he also, for many, many years, I believe he's emeritus professor now, but he taught for many, many years um, at a university. And his, his farm, as I recall, is in Kentucky. I think that's right. And he is, oh, he is, I think, now in his late 80s and just a wonderful, prolific poet and writer. So let's turn to uh, another poem, very, very short poem, and let's just test our thesis about context, paradox, and humility. Can the poem actually teach us those things? You be the judge. This little piece, very short piece called Woods, W-O-O-D-S, Woods, Woods by Wendell Berry. I part, I part the out-thrusting branches. I part the out-thrusting branches and come in beneath. You, you get that scene, you get that image. How many of us, so many of us, I think, have done something like that. I part the out-thrusting branches and come in beneath. The blessed and the blessing trees. Though I am silent, there is singing around me. Though I am silent, there is singing around me. Though I am dark, there is vision around me. Though I am heavy, though I am heavy, there is flight around me. So, even in that short little piece he gives us this brilliant context, and we imagine this grand uh, context and this system, if you will, of 
this tree and these trees and this forest. And he's tell, as he tells us about one specific tree, one specific set of thrusting branches, one specific tree that he is stepping up underneath, one specific tree that is blessed and is also blessing. And he says he is silent, but there is singing around me. I think also there's a kind of humility in in the poet or the at least the speaker in the poem and how the reverence that the poet has for that forest. The reverence and the almost kind of religious spiritual experience that even those few words begin to tease up to and hint at. And so the humility of being awed by that is there. And, and of course, the paradox, though I am dark, there is vision around me. Though I am heavy, there is flight around me. And I would say, even though the speaker in the poem is heavy, he, he is flying. He has taken flight. Poem called Woods by Wendell Berry. You know, um, there are so many um, ways in which I think as we begin to get more mm, comfortable with seeing context, more comfortable with wider boundaries, more comfortable with um, seeing a larger system, even if we don't use that language, it's nothing special about that language, but seeing the whole instead of the reduced part, the reductionist part, instead of seeing, we see a forest with amazing, alive trees and bushes and creatures, instead of seeing natural resources. Oh, what a term. Oh, what a term of terror that is. Natural resources to be used and extracted. That's all. That's what a natural resource is. Rather than a living forest with living beings in that forest. Okay, we're going to uh, do one more poem in this episode again <clears throat> excuse me again by our featured poet it's called the mad farmer liberation front i've always loved this poem and he wrote it many years ago and again remember i mentioned that he has been a farmer farming his um, family's land i guess it's been multiple generations and uh, so um, he wrote this poem some time ago. Now, again, remember, let's think about, uh, does it help? Does this poem help us tease up to wisdom even a little bit? Does it help us with context, with living with paradox and conundrum? And does it help us experience our own humility? The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. Love the quick profit. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. 
I just have to stop for a moment and point out those delicious, you know, the paradox. <laughs> Love someone who does not deserve it. Take all that you have and be poor. You know how the paradox works? It says you want to be free. You know, you've got to do the opposite. You want to be happy? Don't try to be happy. You, um, you want to have control? Give up control and you will have it. The poem continues. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Praise ignorance for what man has not encountered. He has not destroyed. When I first found this poem many years ago, I've known about this poem for I don't know, a long time. But those last, that last line in that stanza is so um, mm, present for me, and it seems like today even more it speaks when he says, Praise ignorance, for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. That is a, that's an indictment for sure, but it certainly gives us a context to tell us that maybe we can stop doing that. Maybe what we can do is stop treating nature as though it were other, as though it were something that had to be conquered, as though it were nothing but a natural resource, as we've already said, as though nature were not sacred, as though we could continue to abuse what we call the natural world with out consequences. And what we are finding is that we are nature. We are not separate, and we are learning that in ways every day. The poem continues. Ask the questions that have no answers. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into mold. Call that Prophet, prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Oh, what a context. Oh, what a perspective. Oh, amazing. But I digress. The poem continues. Listen to the carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Those are two lines that the ecologist Paul Hawken loves to quote, and I can't blame him. I love to quote them too. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. See, for me, this part of the poem speaks to um, a kind of mature, earned hope. You know, um, I, I wrote a song recently called Hope is Not a Strategy, and hope is not a strategy. It is a wonderful attitudinal stance in the world. It is a wonderful place to come from. It is a wonderful pickle juice to pickle ourselves in. Hope is amazing. It's needed. We need hope. But hope is not a strategy, and hope by itself, without action, is not, in the end, 
very helpful. And those and that action need not be something grand and man, uh, you know, fantastical and fantastic. You don't have to be a hero. In fact, you know, they say sorry is the land that needs heroes. We don't need heroes. We need human beings taking steps to be kind to treat the natural world with the reverence that hopefully we treat other human beings. The poem continues. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman nearing near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields, lie down in the shade, rest your head in her lap, swear allegiance to what is nighest your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it, lose it, leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary. Some in the wrong direction practice resurrection. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary. Some in the wrong direction practice resurrection. So ends the poem, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. Well, I think there's amazing, you know, context we've talked about, paradox we've talked about. And I think in this particular poem, the humility comes through when he says, expect the end of the world laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. That is a surrendering. There's another paradox. (laughs) To surrender in order to gain. Let go to gain. And also to surrender is a humble move, especially for we human beings. That doesn't mean stop doing anything. That doesn't mean not to have a plan and to work your plan and to live your values. It doesn't mean any of that. But it is also a great mental health adjustment. It is a great uh, nod to humility to say, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Because I don't know about you, but I see the facts And the facts seem quite dire to me. And yet, and yet, we keep doing what we can do. And yet, there are little green signs, little um, seeds, amazing things which are happening in our world, amazing new um, wisdom that is sprouting. So that is also true as well. And of course, I think that poetry can play a huge role in helping us practice, helping us experience, helping us remember our wisdom, helping us understand our world, inspiring us, of course. And even on those things which are which we have lost and already lost in a lar- in large ways around, the uh, ecological ways, and in small ways in our lives to help us grieve and heal from loss. Poems can do all of that. Okay, well, that's a wrap. So I appreciate so much your listening ear. And if you have learned something, uh, if you have been moved or enjoyed this, uh, I would appreciate it if you would spread the word If you would subscribe, if you haven't, make a comment if you're so moved to do that wherever you listen to this podcast. And uh, in the meantime, 
please take good care of yourself.